retaining your good people is becoming critically important because there aren't any free agents in the market, really. So focusing on your culture is the best way to retain good staff, to recruit easier. And I think that's another trend that we're going to see. As long as the the market stays, especially the unemployment market stays tight, I think we're going to see an ever-increasing focus on culture and, and what we call internal experience. Welcome to the HR L&D podcast with your host, Nick Day. Tune in to discover what it takes to truly develop within human resources as we delve deep into growth, engagement, and leadership strategies that will help you unlock the hidden potential within your business. By listening to this podcast, we hope to empower you and your workforce towards achieving significant HR organizational success. So today on the HR L&D podcast, I'm not just bringing you one incredible speaker, but two, as I got the opportunity to sit down with two amazing culture and leadership experts. Who are they? Well, they are Dr. Rachel Headley and Meg Manke, founders of Rose Group International, who are a leadership training and transition change consultancy who help guide businesses through major changes thanks to increased engagement and powerful new attitudes. Now, Rose Group International, also known as RGI, specialise in leadership development to improve corporate strategic alignment, communication, situational awareness, internal cultures and leadership skills that can really drive and help businesses to prosper and thrive. So who are Rachel and Meg? Well, Dr. Rachel Headley, CEO, is a PhD scientist who spent two decades working in the satellite industry. She uses the lessons she learned from working in big teams and undertaking complex challenges to create solutions for businesses that actually work. She's managed multi-million dollar projects. She's united diverse international stakeholders and she's guided teams through significant change. Meanwhile, Meg Manke, COO, is a human resources professional with decades of experience in leading HR officers in large multinational corporations. She's merged organizations, she's designed and implemented behavior-based culture initiatives, and she's developed leaders in a variety of businesses. She has degrees in finance, business ethics, and strategic leadership, and both Rachel and Meg are also renowned TEDx speakers who have delivered HR Disrupt Talks on stage to over 12 thousand delegates. Now their Rose International programs are based on their book IX Leadership. Now IX Leadership stands for internal experience and this is something we're going to find out all about during the course of this episode. If you want to know more about culture types, great leadership, how to implement change, how you can create a culture of innovation and you're going to really enjoy this episode. We've got two exceptional speakers, one hour of content. Listeners, fasten your seatbelts. Let's begin. Hello and welcome to the HR L&D podcast sofa. Today I am joined by Rachel and Meg and as you know from the introduction we are in really 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 great hands. Two amazing professionals who have a new book which we're going to talk about in more detail during the course of this podcast but Meg and Rachel how are you doing today? Well we're doing fantastic. We're pretty good. Fantastic fantastic. Well let's jump straight into the questions. Five quick questions understanding where we are to know where we are going. You obviously both have very incredibly impressive yet diverse backgrounds. Meg, I understand you're a ranch kid from Western South Dakota, where I know you still put in a hard day's work at the family place. And Rachel, you rose through the ranks at a global satellite mission uh, from intern to satellite scientist to operational science officer. So I'd love it if you could just give our listeners a little bit of a flavour of how these I guess early beginnings have led you to forming the Rose Group International together and and also the IX Leadership Framework. Why don't you start, Meg? Yeah, okay. Uh, Well, I I would say being horseback at five years old uh, taught me a lot uh, that bathroom breaks are few and far between, so take advantage (laughs) of them. Um, And how to be uh, perseverant. Um, And I carried that through all of my career in transportation and logistics and then Um, into hospitality and eventually into mining, where I was an HR manager at a gold mine. And uh, it was that job that I was uh, working at when Rachel and I started to uh, put our respective energies together and uh, set out to change the world and the way work gets done and the way people are treated at work. And her background is so complimentary. Uh, We joke that 
you know, it's from underground mining to outer space, right? We got it all covered. And um, we have, you know, for us, her her background is so complimentary because she's got a master's degree in strategic leadership. She's has the org development chops uh, where I came from the um, the side of more project management I, in my leadership role. I was um, supported in a team that had, you know, we had um, people that did everything from health and safety of the spacecraft all the way down to database management and uh, 40,000 users, uh, community international. So uh, we just have very different backgrounds. I'm, uh, you know, definitely PhD, White Tower, um, philosophy, doctor of philosophy. And, you know, Meg is um, with her master's degree, but her focus on getting things done and accountability and motivating people. We have a very similar way we like to do business. And so even though we have this really crazy diverse background, we really align very tightly on how we actually like to, to motivate people. So that's how it kind of all works. Great. Fantastic. Sounds like a, a really good partnership, which I think is, it shows through your, your writing as well. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later on. I know that something you're both quite passionate about is, is obviously engagement. And, and you know, personally, I feel that engagement is at the, uh, at the heart of culture at the moment and subject that I've got some familiarity with myself. I'm, I'm studying a master's at the moment, funnily enough, in professional consulting. And this talks a lot about culture models. You know, we've been studying things like Charles Handy's Four Archetypes, theories of Edwin Schein and, and, and Gert Hofstede as well. But your approach to culture types is a little bit different. And I know from your research and perspective, how would you both describe culture types? Uh, I would say culture types are a way for an organization to understand the dynamics that exist on a team by knowing more about people's work preferences and what kind of an environment they like to operate in. Yeah, and from my perspective, we're, you know, my science background um, I was just telling Meg this morning, I, I really like this forest analogy that that I keep coming back to, which is, and it's not in the book, so it's a nice sort of bridge where, you know, if you have a, a bunch of trees, like if you think of your business as you need people to run your business, but there's a vast difference in, let's say, a forest, you need trees to have a forest, but there's a big difference between a plantation where there's trees just existing next to each other and a forested ecosystem where you have to understand how everyone works together and every, the value of all the components. And so our, our system really allows you to understand the dynamic that exists across your entire team and organization that actually gives you insight into how to actually strategically grow your firm, your company, or your organization. So can we, can we expand on that a little bit more? It's something that uh, I know our listeners are very much HR-led. We've got a lot of training and, and, and senior HR leadership professionals that listen to this podcast. For them, how can being aware of, of their team's culture types immediately improve the way that they, that, that, that they communicate internally? Uh, well, an example that we used from a client uh, that Rachel actually worked with was uh, we had a, a fixer and an organizer. So those two are opposite culture types. And the organizer generated this, I'll give you the brief version, 25 page report for every event that they put on. They did their uh, event planning uh, management company. And the organizer, you know, put this whole, every bit of information you could need down to what kind of, how many ply the toilet paper was um, in this report. And the fixer um, could go in that report and find any amount of information that he wanted or any piece of information. um, And yet he didn't. Uh, he would always go ask her first instead of checking his email, which drove her crazy because she's thinking, gosh, you know, she likes details and order. She put it all in the email. Um, and he's thinking, I'd rather just chat with you about it. It doesn't seem, why is that a big deal to you? And so really, I think the the biggest um, win or the biggest favor that culture types do for a leader is you immediately can see the differences that exist in people's work preferences and and start to think differently about how you want to work with your team. Was it that that prompted you to to create the culture types within the IX leadership? I mean, the, the book, uh, for those not familiar, and I'll, I will put a link in the episode notes, is IX Leadership, Create High Five Cultures and Guide Transformation. Um, and obviously, it's something we're going to be discussing now. But was it was it that, I guess, the culture types that helped prompt you both to, to, to writing this book? Yeah, it was interesting. It's sort of the, we sort of backed into the culture types actually, because what we did is we've both been in the trenches at big organizations, working with people, trying to figure out how to motivate them, why some things work for some people and not others, why two really good people can't seem to stand to be in the same room together. So, you know, we, especially um, in change environments and transition. So we, 
in our, you know, in the U.S. anyway, there's a huge amount of mergers and acquisitions going on. You know, sort of a way to protect against the next recession is people are just investing in vertical integration and that sort of thing. And you know, in those stressful change environments, transition environments, people sort of retreat to their corners. Um, the the executive teams are all high fiving and drinking scotch and celebrating, and now you that the the pain of that passes on often to the HR people and the ops leads, and and so people people freak out. They don't know what that means. Are they going to have a job? Um, who's going to, there's always winners and losers when you reorganize. And so what happened with us is we saw that people would retreat to their corners and, and these differences we saw in people would actually just kind of amp up. And so what we really tried to figure out is what are the corners that people retreat back into and why do two great people not relate well? And, and what we decided was that a big, big difference that most assessments, if not all assessments, don't do now and certainly don't do well is the chain, how people deal with the chaos around change. So we are a big piece of what we look at is your chaos tolerance. And then, um, and then of course, are, are you team driven? Are you one of those people that needs to be embedded in a team or are you happy to work on your own? So those are the two, we kind of backed into the, we're like, we have to be able to figure out who these people are in a way that other leaders can use. And so that's how we kind of backed into the culture type stuff. Sure, sure. And have you found then, as you said, you've got some of those team building based people, if you like, and you've obviously identified some of the corners that people like to retreat to. Have you, have you found that the way an organization is structured you know, has a, a direct, um, I guess, effect on the way that the, that business communicates? So, for example, if you... If you found that approaches differ for those businesses that may have a very flat structure versus those that have a matrix or a hierarchical structure? Uh, I don't know if we've seen too much of a difference based on um, flat structures versus a more varied structure. But I would say the, the leader's culture type can definitely have an effect on maybe who like, what, you know, like hires like they say. And so if you, you know, if you have a fixer uh, leader, they might hire a lot of fixers like them because they see the value in the way they see the world. So sometimes we see that, but really we've seen some, some sort of trending based on industry. So manufacturing industry, you find a lot of stabilizers uh, because that work is team driven and order tolerant. And so it's the kind of the same thing day in and day out. And the, the guy in front of me and the lady behind me all have to do their job well or, or I don't perform well. So stabilizers are drawn to that kind of work. So by industry, we've seen some trends, but I would say we haven't seen any specific trends based on org structure um, in any certain case. We talked about fixes and stabilizers. What, what are the, the key culture types that you, you have both defined then for those listening to this to try and understand? I can, I can sort of get an understanding of what those two individuals might look like. What are the other ones that you've, you've discovered that you've, I, I guess, are termed under either a fixer, stabilizer or any other, any other culture types that you've found? Yeah. So for if you for me, it's easier to sort of describe visually because that's how we walk through it. So if you can imagine a a quadrant, a a simple scatter plot, I guess, what would we, a graph with four areas. Um, The top of that graph is a chaos and the bottom of that graph is order. And so we have at the top half of that graph are fixers and those are team driven. And then we have independents and they're self-driven. So those are our two chaos types. And then on the, on the bottom half of that graph on the left side is stabilizers who are order tolerant and team driven. And then on the other side are organizers who are um, order tolerant and self-driven. So those are the four. And what we do is we create a, a quantitative result. So you don't just get like, I'm a fixer, but I actually we actually plot a point on that graph. And so I know exactly how, if I'm more chaos tolerant or more team driven or more or less than Meg is. And so it's not just a broad category. It's a very specific relative um, result that you can look at your team in a, in a more comprehensive way. Sure, sure, that makes sense. And if you found as well, and in the UK would say something like, uh, when it comes to, to soccer, would say, you know, 11 David Beckhams wouldn't necessarily make a great football team because, you know, you need individuals, you need differences in in the way that in your playing style, for example. Um, so as good as he may be on his own, actually you need 
you know, a, a different harmony of individuals as a team to make that team successful. If you found it the same with culture types, you really do need a blend of those four to, to create organisational success? Or have you found that it can be leveraged one way or another where certain individuals result in, in different success stories? Well, uh, we actually... We actually talk more about the kind of work that needs to be done as opposed to what's the or in order to determine what's the proper makeup um, of a team. But I would say even before that, because we work with a lot of teams that are already they're already there, they're already structured, they already have who they have. And we do not come in and say, oh, well, gosh, you know, your fix are heavy. So, you know, let's what's your bottom three performers on the fixer side and then let's hire three stabilizers. Um, what we really talk about with culture types uh where the magic is in culture types is understanding your team um, and, and then understanding what certain kinds of work people enjoy um, and ergo will be successful at. Uh, so we really don't talk too much about, uh, I mean, we get asked that question all the time because especially with clients are like, oh my God, we don't have any independence. Is that bad? And we say, no, that's not bad. That just means you know that there isn't an independent on your team. So perhaps the person who's a fixer, right, you know, next door to the independent, um, will have to, you know, kind of put on the independent hat once in a while and challenge the group about, you know, does this really make sense for our company? So that's really how we talk about it as opposed to um, it, telling people exactly what they need to be successful. Yeah. And frankly, uh, Nick, the s- certain industries attract different types, different culture types. So if you think about manufacturing, they tend to attract stabilizers because that's your grandpa did that same job and it's going to be reliable. And I, I have good salary and I know exactly what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. And those people love that environment. And if you think about a U.S. example, so um, on the two ends, we have SpaceX, which is, you know, Elon, sexy, smoking weed on whatever the show and really creative and inspiring, but is so far in the red that you don't even know if he's going to be a company in 10 years. Um, versus NASA, who is this huge bureaucratic organization who has zero risk tolerance for anything, but is incredibly successful at everything they attempt. And you're going to see that if you're an engineer, you're going to be attracted to one of those places. If you're a a fixer or a chaotic engineer, you're probably going to want to go work for SpaceX. If you're a stabilizer or an organizer engineer, you're probably going to go work for NASA. And so the magic is understanding what kind of company and what kind of people you have and then how to leverage that. You're right in the sense that sometimes you need organizer work done and there's no organizer on your team. But what that means is we're not, we're not here to make everyone happy all the time. What we're here to say is sometimes the fixer is going to have to do organizer work because it's work and the work needs doing. But most of the time, the fixer is going to want to do something else. So how can, how can you as a leader balance the roles so that everyone's working in their sweet spot as much as possible? Yeah, that, that makes total sense. A brilliant answer. No, I think that's uh, contextualized it perfectly for me as well. So thanks for that. So let, let's let's stay on the culture type piece then. So what, from your view, would make culture types um, a, a more effective than perhaps other popular work-based assessments that we might be more familiar with? Well, I would say uh, we built it for business. And so it's not borrowed from psychology. And, you know, hopefully maybe we can draw some conclusions based on personal characteristics. Um, we actually, we built it for business so that business owners can look at the results very quickly. It's only, the assessment is only 14 questions long. Uh, we made it that way on purpose because to sit down for half an hour and fill out one more assessment on top of all of the security IT tests we have to take now, and God knows what else, uh, you know, people just, frankly, they're not going to really put that much effort into it. So we, we made it short and sweet on purpose and the results are easy to look at. The scatter plot is, uh, very, I don't, this is a technical American term, businessy looking. <laughs> uh, and so I would say, you know, those are the, those are the main qualities that set it apart and you get us to go with it. So, right. Well, and I think the other thing too, is that we really approach it from a systems perspective. Um, you know, DISC and Myers-Briggs are now, have now, which is more common in the States to use. They've, they've, pro- they've tried to sort of creep into how you actually look at your company as a team based on those individual results. And, um, and frankly, it's just, it's found to be ineffective or not easily integratable and lots of other challenges. And so we started by not only for business, but also a team-based assessment so that it is absolutely usable in a, 
because it's all about change. And the world today, business today is all about change and it's all about team. And so if you don't start there, then it's kind of force fit and a little awkward, frankly. Sure, that makes sense. And I think you know, a lot of the podcasts we do are talking about how things are moving on at a really fast rate and you need to, to evolve. Um, as, a, as someone said to me, if, you don't, if you're not evolving, you're evaporating. So it's, uh, it's important that we're looking at things that push things forward. How do you think work cultures then will continue to evolve? Have you got any sort of predictive ideas on where, the, where and how things might change in the future? It depends if they use culture types or not, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, boy, I'd be a hedge. I'd be a hedge fund manager if I had the answer to that question. But um, I, I think, I think that the. I guess my opinion on the whole deal is, especially from a generational perspective, things are probably what we see anyway is a, a trend of kind of balancing out when it comes to leadership theory. So you know, it's kind of went from transactional leadership to transformational and then into servant leadership, um, which was either misconstrued or done really poorly. And then there's no accountability. And now people are kind of coming a little bit back and saying, Hey, well, no, we want there to be some accountability in the workplace. So I think as far as work cultures go, you're going to maybe see less of the Google esque kind of work cultures where there's beanbags and beer on tap um, and maybe more, uh, accountability, maybe bring up some of those, you know, a lot of companies have flattened out their structures. I think you might see some of that going away and building in some hierarchy again, um, or at least in terms of controls and accountability, even mm-hmm. if they don't do it actually in their org chart. I, and I think the gift that millennials have given us, I'm a Gen Xer, you know, they're demanding workplaces where they actually want to be and where they're, they're not miserable. And, you know, they're a big, they're a huge part of the workforce now. And I think that's been a big gift. I mean, as a Gen Xer, it's not like I ever raised my hand and said, I want, I don't care if I go to work and I hate it. And I just want to slog. It's just, we didn't really feel like we had a voice in making those demands or certainly making our expectations met. And I really think it's fantastic, frankly, that there is a lot more focus on culture right now. And, and part of it in the U S is because our workforce is like, we have like, 3% unemployment. And so retaining your good people is becoming critically important because there aren't any free agents in the market, really. So focusing on your culture is the best way to retain good staff, to recruit easier. And I think that's another trend that we're going to see as long as the the market stays, especially the the, um, unemployment market stays tight. I think we're going to see an ever increasing uh, focus on culture and, and what we call internal experience. So Fantastic. Well, listen, we're after we're going to jump into some questions, find out a little bit more about the both of you, and then we're going to find out all about your book. But before we do, I'm delighted to say to all of our listeners that we actually have a, a few free audio book codes that you can actually access uh, the new book, IX Leadership, Create High Five Cultures and Guide Transformation on Amazon. If you want to access a free code, all you have to do is answer the following question. Email me your answers at nick at jjrecruitment.com. Uh, the question is, and Rachel May don't even know this question is coming yet so do keep listening to find out the answer but the question is if rachel and meg were each given a superpower what would those superpowers be so listen on to find out the answer to that question email it over to myself for a free audio book code where you can access this book and listen uh, of course to all to all of uh, rachel and meg's um views on uh, through the book as well i don't know if it's is it yourself that's uh, that do the audio um recordings yourself we yes we did we did record it ourselves and it's much harder than you think it is. <laughs> Excellent. So you get to hear these wonderful voices all over again in uh, in much more detail. So email over those answers to me shortly. So let's quickly break and find out a little bit more about you both. Time to find out more about you. How do you both relax in your downtime? Uh, I uh, I work out and run. I'm a marathon runner, so uh, that um, my my downtime typically consists of watching my uh, nine-year-old play soccer or my 10-year-old dance, really. <laughs> yeah, and I, I'm a, I love to travel uh, for fun. I, we travel a lot for the business, but uh, my downtime is spent often um, abroad. So that's what my real passion is, international travel. So I, do, I, I love that. Do you have a favorite place you like to visit? I really like ancient human sites. I, I don't know why. Machu Picchu is a favorite. I've been to Egypt and so I've got some other ones. Jordan, I'm not sure how soon I'll make uh, because of the unrest there, but there's lots of, that's kind of where I like to go. I like to explore the ancient human human locations. 
two, two, two recommendations I'll give if you haven't seen them. Um, I'll definitely try and get to Angkor Wat in Cambodia. I don't know if that's on your list, but that place is incredible. Uh, and Ephesus in Turkey is another, which is uh, you feel like you've been transported somewhere and they've, they've just got this amazing town, sort of just uh, phenomenal. But anyway, I have a similar passion. So they're two of mine. If you, if you want to add them to your list, I definitely recommend visiting those two locations. Um, for you both, who who have been the biggest sort of influences on, on your individual careers to date? Uh, mine would be first, my parents, my parents both, uh, encouraged me to do well, really whatever I wanted to, and they never let off the gas pedal on that deal. So here we are. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and then I had a professor when I was in college at Creighton university, um, Dr. Beverly Crocker, and she, she really lit a fire, um, under my, kind of my, my passion to find the better. So I would say those are my three, three majors. Mm, that's, good, that's good ones. Um, I too love, uh, my folks are incredibly supportive. Um, although my dad wanted me to be a pharmacist, so sorry, dad. Um, but, um, you know, honestly for my career, besides being set up with, uh, you know, a home environment that was really supportive of education. My mom has a PhD. Um, my dad uh, hates reading though. So, you know, it's a good balance. Um, my, it's probably my daughter, honestly, because, um, I was actually, um, laid off of a job at a local university and I could have gone anywhere, uh, especially with my Landsat background. I have an, uh, an international contact list. And, um, but my ex-husband lives in the small town that we live in. And my daughter at that time was about six and I didn't want to move away, um, and have to have her try to split time between two very different places. So, um, I decided to stay in Spearfish in this little mountain town that we live in. And, uh, I decided to stay here and make whatever work from here. And that's sort of how I got into consulting and traveling and, but having my home here. So, you know, strangely, um, she's been one of the most um, critical people in my career, especially in the last 11 years. And Great. Excellent. So we're going to get to that question now, which allows people to uh, to make notes so they can email in to me at nick at jjrecruitment.com to get their free audio codes for your audio book. If either of you or both of you are, if you could be given any superpower, what would it be and why? Uh, well, this would put us out of business, but uh, common sense. If I could boop people on the nose and they would have more common sense, that would make the world a dreamy place for me. So that's your superpower? That would be my that, superpower. That is a good superpower for you. Yeah. Her, her, she's a no, it's definitely a new one for the podcast. Right. She's a no, she's a no excuses uh, accountability guru. So she's definitely, I can see that about you. Yeah. Uh, mine is also, uh, well, I guess yours is pretty selfish too, uh, in that sense. But uh, telekinesis, for sure. If I could magic myself to all the places I travel instead of dealing with a commercial uh, aircraft carrier or airlines, that would be amazing. So I would love to just have a little, you know, Star Trek. Beam me up, Scotty. Beam me up, Scotty pad, and it would get send me to wherever. That would be fantastic. That's mine. Very nice. Fantastic. Excellent. Well, I hope everyone's taken notes. Send those answers over to me. Get access to your free audio codes for the audio book, uh, which we're going to find out all about now. Have you ever asked yourself, how can any recruiter understand my HR recruitment challenges? Please don't give up on your hiring challenges just yet. Here at JGA HR Recruitment, we appreciate the difficulties associated with attracting, recruiting and retaining top human resources talent. We also understand just how costly a poor hire can be. JGA HR Recruitment would like to partner with you to help you overcome your hiring challenges. Contact us today on 01727 800 377 or visit jgarecruitment.com to find out more. Shaping the future of human resources together. Final questions. So the audiobook, of course, IX Leadership, Create High Five Cultures and Guide Transformation. Uh, that is available on audiobook on Amazon. I will put a link in the episode notes or you can access a code completely free if you email me and aren't th- those answers to my email address. So Rachel and Meg, your book, 
Um, it's been called brutally honest, incredibly practical and refreshingly hopeful. Uh, it tackles the idea that corporate success is hampered by the failure to create an internal experience, which you obviously uh, shortened to IX, that keeps the best people, enables true innovation and creativity and implements change quickly and effectively. So with that in mind, what should businesses be doing to improve the internal experience? Uh, well, I would say from an executive level, the first thing that we really talk about with our potential clients is decide you want to know. Because uh, the, the, there has to be buy-in from the very top. That's something that hasn't really changed over the years. Um, and so, you know, a lot of times, uh, an analogy I've been using a lot lately is organizations want to be uh, like a German shepherd. They want to be, you know, very well-trained, very disciplined, uh, sharp-looking. Um, but they don't they want to put in the work of, say, like a black lab, a Labrador, which is, you know, kind of chaotic and ridiculous, doesn't slobbering pay attention, mess. slobbering <laughs> mess. <laughs> so, so I think the first rules of engagement for changing your culture, improving your culture are decide you want to know what people say isn't great about your organization and then decide you're ready to do something about it. Yeah, I like that, uh, especially the slobbery dog analogy. I'm totally using that. Yeah. Um, the other thing for me is actually understand where you are in the context of the market in a different way, in in the way of the kind of work you're doing and in the way of where, where you want to grow um, in that same sort of SpaceX versus NASA sort of analogy. You know, if you are if you're recruiting, if the kind of company you are is we have a friend who runs a professional CEO network, and he always says that they're building the plane as they're flying it. And so that's clearly a very chaotic work environment. And so you're going to attract those people to you. The hard thing about that is someone's going to actually have to be order tolerant in that organization to actually make sure that the things are getting done the way they need to get done. And so it's really uh, understanding the kind of people that you have and the kind of people you're going to attract and who will actually help you achieve your goals. And so almost in every chain for the change management professionals out there, the first thing every change management process tells you is understand your people. And it's kind of the same way. If you don't know who you have, then you have no idea how to actually motivate them, create structure that resonates with them and how to actually help them be productive and effective for your organization. Sure, sure. And I have to say, as an HR recruiter, we've seen a real shift in what businesses are trying to achieve, but not necessarily with better either financial or recruitment results. So for example, uh, particularly in London, there's been a lot of businesses wanting to move into becoming more, well, we can, I'll put this, more Google-esque or Facebook-esque. You know, everyone wants these, these rooms where they can relax and there's no real hours of work you can change or the four-day week or, you know, real trends. Even uh, some recruitment owners that I know have, have moved their businesses to agile working four-day week only environments to attract different people to their businesses. But the results haven't necessarily in all cases followed the changes and they've actually some in some cases lost staff because they haven't liked the changes and particularly in, in payroll and human resources where I've always specialized change isn't always welcomed um, and I don't think business has always predicted that so have you seen some of these changes taking place as a result of some of the much bigger corporates trying to attract staff and be be different it's so cool because it's, I mean, it's sad that you're seeing a lack of performance in some areas, but the crazy thing is if they would have done their culture type assessment before they decided that they would have changed how they did it. Because if in payroll and HR, for example, we do see a lot of order tolerant people. And if the, the what's happening, I suspect is they're, they're deciding it's a different root, the wrong root cause. So if you need, if you want more innovative, innovative and creative solutions and you're not getting it in your staff, um, perhaps of what you already have, well, then then look at what roles that you can add to encourage innovation and what kinds of creative and chaotic people that you can bring into the team that will push the ways of thinking, the ways of doing to completely change your work environment means that that's alienating all of the order tolerant people that you already have on your team. And so the beautiful thing about that example is that if they would have done their culture type assessment, they may have made different decisions and have been had a lot more successful results. 
Sure, sure, that makes sense. Now, Rachel, I know you believe in the internal uh, experience, and uh, to mention that again, that's where the IX comes from in your in your leadership title of your book. Um, and you know that I know the internal experience of an organisation is very much a leadership choice, or it tends to be led by the leaders at the top of a business. So, what do you mean by internal experience, and and, and I guess what are you seeing in, in the industry at the moment? Well, uh, we so Rachel and I were at a conference, uh, speaking at a conference in. Arizona and Phoenix, Arizona at Carvana a couple years back. And it was, it was a little bit comical because these folks that are in the customer service space were talking about oh, CSCX, which is customer service, customer experience. And, you know, oh man, our customers aren't happy. The, the uh, feedback we're getting from customers, not great. We can't figure out what it is. And then they would, then they kind of Oh, oh, and by the way, we have this really bad retention issue with our customer service folks. And we said, well, how come? I don't know. They don't like the environment, but we've got beer on tap and we've got all this great stuff like bicycles, bicycles. They can ride around. We have flexible hours. We have all this really cool stuff. So we just don't really know. Um, And so we said, well, what are they? What kind of feedback do you get from them? Oh, well, our training isn't good and they don't know what they're doing and they don't know how they can grow with the company and on and on and on. So we said, so that's what you know, what if you focused on your, what we would call your internal experience, that person's experience, and then wouldn't that follow through to your customer service, customer experience? And so kind of the reason that we talk about things the way we do is that we we basically have a different perspective on the root cause of, you know, customer issues. It's not the customer, it's probably not even the product, it's probably the customer service they're getting. And, and if they were getting better if the people felt better about where they worked um, and it was more fulfilling and engaging and motivating, then they're going to take better care of your clients. So that's kind of our perspective on IX. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, we've, in, as a recruiter, I've seen a huge change uh, or shift rather than the number of employers looking for UX specialists. So that's the user experience. So I'm very much thinking about um, you know how their business is, is portrayed by the consumers, if you like, the consuming their products. But I've never really heard before your book of anyone considering it from an IX perspective. And actually, that's what drives the UX anyway. If 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 you sort of gauge it back, and as you've just described, and I think in your book you state that fifty percent of people are potentially disengaged at work, and and every leader around the world therefore should be looking for the leadership approach that can fix that problem. So. I think you've touched upon it already, but how can the IX leadership model that you've both uh, designed address that disengagement at work? Well, the the main part that we feel that the the culture types will help address is this idea that um, people aren't leaders aren't really leveraging the energy of the people that they have, right? So that that example, in fact, we've seen as high as eighty three percent of employees are somewhat disengaged from their company. So um, the challenge is mostly that we feel that leaders just don't know who they have working for them and they don't understand how to create an environment where they can thrive. And um, as an example, we were talking to a big port authority um, and they were asking us, they're recruiters, HR recruiters and and customer service focused. And they said, you know, does your assessment measure people's ability to want to help other people to be helpful? And we said, well, no, not directly. But, you know, our argument was if you're having people that you hire that aren't being good stewards and good, helpful to your clients, then there's some other problem. So what what we would say is understand who your people are. Um, Think about an airport, because this was a port authority. We use the example. If you have to hire somebody who's going to run around the airport and in a wheelchair and pick up people at all the airplanes but and you know that you know half the time that it's going to change and half the time they're going to be planes that are late and all of a sudden you're supposed to be in two places and how do you manage that and run around and who's going to be doing it well then you're going to want someone who's pretty co- tolerance of chaos in that job right because they're going to be racing around and and might have to change direction midday or maybe um maybe multiple times a day um if you're looking to hire somebody that's going to make sure that the concourses look nice, you're going to be taking out garbage and maybe cleaning the bathrooms. Well, then you're going to want someone who's really order tolerant, who wants to do the same thing all the time, who doesn't necessarily want that chaotic work environment. And so very quickly, you can see that the same exact person that has um, a skill set of 
um, you know, wants to do work every day and you put them in the wrong place in that business, they're going to really not like their job. And it's not because they're bad people or they're being jerks or they're not motivated. It's just like you are not allowing them to work in a way that allows them to thrive. So if we just did that, if we if we just took a look at who we have on the team, the roles that we have and making sure people work in an environment where they're comfortable, they can be successful and they will work crazy hard for you. And and frankly, salary is not that important anymore if it ever was. And and so that's really the key. If all you do is understand what roles you have on your job and in your company and make sure that the people that are working those jobs are the right culture type, that would be a massive jump in engagement, morale and productivity. Yeah, sure. And we we definitely don't see the main reason people change jobs in what we do here in the UK as being salary led. It's nearly always leadership led. It's usually because they don't like or or like the way they're being managed or the way they're being led. So with that in mind, what advice would you give to leaders who who want to implement change? They want to improve uh, the culture. They, They want to be more innovative and they want to inspire powerful teams to produce. What advice would you give to those leaders listening to this podcast? Uh, well, the first thing I would say is read our book because that's going to help a lot. And then I would say culture type people. So you understand who you've got working on your teams. Um, and, you know, I, I, Rachel's right. It's all about it's, you know, we we talk about empathy and accountability as a strategy. So it's all about understanding your people. Um, and then also remembering that you're running a business. You need those people to be productive. And so you have to hold them accountable. And that that over the course of, you know, all the years I've spent in HR is the, that is the crux of what people are looking for. Generally speaking, they want an opportunity to be heard. Um, but also they want there to be some consistency so they know how to succeed and that everybody else is kind of being held to the same standard. So, Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I would say once you've read the book or listened to it, um, and, then culture typed your people really do some kind of thinking, fact finding, soul searching about, you know, are we really being empathetic um, or are we being sympathetic? Because that's usually the case, you know, and are we really holding people accountable or are we kind of setting ourselves up for an employment law issue? Yeah. and, And frankly, one of the things that I think is important to realize for leaders is that when you don't, I love Meg's example of ho- holding everyone to a standard, because of course your your IX your culture is the worst behavior that you allow, and I just feel like the consistency and it is so important and the accountability because what happens for leadership is you give away your power and authority when you let people when you don't hold people accountable. So if you have staff that are coming in late or they're not delivering on time and there is no consequence or there's no um, expected level of delivery, then you're allowing them to decide what your company is going to be. And so it's imperative for leaders today who want to craft the kind of organization that they envision to make sure that they hold, they create and hold um, that level of accountability, because if they don't, you're giving away your authority to the people, the worst people in your organization. Sure. I love that. And I think that that, that's really uh, crystallized your views in my head now I can sort of that's given me a really good visual I think I've probably fallen found that as, as a manager of my own recruitment firm and sometimes maybe I should be you know, hold people to account a little bit more than sometimes I do they might you know, my staff might be listening to this but they'll know what I mean but sometimes you 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 feel like you're letting them off and you really shouldn't be and sometimes you do set a standard because it's very hard to discipline the next person to do something if if you know you've let it go two or three times before. So um, I personally have definitely fallen foul of that practice and it's something that I def- def- definitely need to work on myself. Um, do, but So let's say someone listens to your uh, your book, they've read, or they've read your book. Do you think in the future that you might be setting um, a blueprint for how businesses might structure themselves in the future in the sense that they might actually become IX specialists within an HR department who rather than just leave all the accountability with the current line managers for the internal experience. There may actually be internal experience professionals who their full-time role is to try and look at culture alignment, try and look at how they can improve the experience. As you say, not just get bicycles because they're cool and funky if that's not what the staff 
actually want if it's the training that's letting them down. Do you think that in the future we might see some of these roles start to exist within businesses and grow from that side? Because the way you've both discussed it, it, for me, it kind of makes sense that that might be a good development and innovation for businesses to start bringing in rather than relying on product to keep people happy, actually get a person into to listen to them as a full time role to, to really improve that internal experience. Yeah, uh, we actually have um, our material all uh, in a learning management system online. And we do have some clients who have done just that. They've they've decided that, you know what, this is really important. And so they put one of their HR um, generalists through the training so that she could then they, they had us culture type all their folks and we did the consulting work. And then they also had her do the full certification, IX certification, so that she could carry that through within their organization as they hire new people and, and grow as a business. So, yeah, there's uh, there's such real potential for it. It's already really happening. Yeah. And it's a great way to have a long term impact. I mean, it's one thing to do a one time assessment and you feel good about who you have. And, you know, the thing that we dread the most, uh, Nick, is those trainings and, and learning opportunities where you go and you go to three days of training and you go home and you're so excited and then you go back to the same matrix from whence you came and then everything is the same. And so this is really a strategy that we have to make sure that it's a continually applied process, that it's not a one and done. The worst thing we want to do is feel like we're wasting people's time and money. And so that's a really exciting way for us to have a long-term impact and really actually affect change in organizations. Because as you know, um, it takes more than three days. So, Sure, sure. Now, oh, I mean, between the two of you, you both possess a significant number of, sort of high-level academic qualifications, multiple degrees, of course, a, a, a doctorate between you as well. Do you think a good academic foundation is important when it comes to developing strong leaders or... or in particular, when it comes to developing influence? No. No. Cool. I mean, good job getting your master's <laughs> degree, good. Nick. We love that. Yeah, yeah, no, that's um, all right. Don't worry. No, I, have a PhD, I get it. I get it. No, I mean, we um, we have absolutely, you know, we're of the opinion that it absolutely doesn't matter what your credentials are on paper. I, I think that it depends on, I suppose, what level you are in the organization. I mean, it, even for our business, not that I wouldn't look at someone who wasn't quote unquote qualified on paper to be our CFO, but it would certainly give me more comfort, comfort to know that, you know, maybe they have a finance degree or at least some sort of business admin degree. But I think, um, where, where it really matters within an organization is, you know, those frontline supervisors who are kind of the the, vo- the voice box or mouthpiece for the company to the employees and then out to the community, um, th- they don't, I mean, a lot of times they're just promoted because they've got really great chops and whatever technical skill they have, but they're not trained to be a leader. So all the things that they've learned in their whole career don't matter when it comes down to being a leader. So I think in terms of like actual good leadership, um, no, education is zero important. As a matter of fact, being book smart kind of can destroy you a little bit. I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, um, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, we, we also know, like, um, my, my partner in life um, runs his own company. And he has, uh, he had four years of military service in the Air Force. And he's highly, su- excuse me, highly successful, um, cares about his people, um, has grown his company, and so that has no, nothing to, now he is hamstrung in some ways because he didn't know what a spreadsheet was before uh, we started dating, but um, he was keeping track on three notebooks. And I was like, what is this system? Um, but so he's hamstrung in some ways that way, but at the other way, he's constantly learning. And so it's really your attitude about um, constant learning. There's always something new just because you don't learn that in, um, you know, at a, at a university doesn't mean that um, you don't have, there's not opportunities for you to learn the things that you need. So we are, we're real advocates of, I don't know if we're anti-degree because clearly we have our degrees, but we really believe that degrees do not equal a leadership capability. I guess. Sure, sure. No, that, I think you've articulated that really clearly. Um, and that's actually some of the reasons you've touched upon, one of the reasons I'm doing the, the master's myself. It's, um, it's a, sometimes an internal credibility piece to tell myself that I can, uh, I can do some of the work that I've got ahead of me and, and, and go in with a little bit more confidence. It's very much a personal thing rather than an external 
uh, reasoning for, for, for undertaking it. So um, I think that really helped and that was good. Well, listen, the last question before we enter the, uh, the HR L&D vault. Uh, in your book, IX Leadership, it contains tools and perspectives, not just for, for navigating corporate cultures, but also to improve self-awareness. So I wondered if you could both sum up your your key objectives for the book, what would they be and what tools can, you know, people picking up the book tomorrow, what, what kind of tools can they take away from the book if they were to read it cover to cover that can really, I guess, help them to become better leaders and to really improve the internal experience for their employees? I would say um, the the middle part of the book is about, it's all about change and understanding how, you, how people are going through change, uh, especially based on their culture type. So I think that, one of the major aha moments most people have when they read the book is to understand or to have an explanation about what happens during change. And they're like, oh, that's why that person does that thing that I think is so weird. So I think reading that middle section and understanding that there people see change differently, uh, that's really helpful. And then the last section of the book is a lot of tips and tricks about, um, just how do you engage with people on a daily basis, uh, it, uh, knowing that they're different than you and all the things you've learned in the first two sections. So I, I guess my major objective for anybody reading it would be to understand that you have to give people a little bit of grace and ask a lot of questions so that you feel comfortable that they are holding themselves accountable. And then if they're not, you have to figure out what you're going to do about it. Any particular tips you could you could give someone to take away now if they're listening to this? Game? There's one tip I can give before that, that I can get your listeners to take away and potentially implement straight away in the way that they either speak to employees or the way that they're handling change. Is there a tip you can you can share? Yeah, I think the the tip that that we the tip that we talk about the most probably is that um, when you're having conflict with someone, it's not about you. So, like for instance. Um, if you have someone, Meg is an independent and she prefers to spend some of her time working on her own. And so we in the, in our team had a conversation about, you know, how often we all need to be in the room together and how often we need to be apart in order to have people be the most successful. And so when Meg was telling me about that, there wasn't a moment where I thought, oh, it's because Meg hates me or, oh, it's because Meg's trying to make my life harder. Um it's not really about you. It's about her and what she needs. And, and there's a balance between that empathy and accountability. And if she needed to not be in the office and didn't perform, or if I needed to be in the office and I didn't perform, then that's a different conversation. But um, for, from that perspective, our, our tip is, uh, it's really not about you. And, and I guess one other one from my, for the goal from the book, from my perspective, one of the things that's been the most powerful is to have people understand that they it's uh, it's okay to be to do be and do the things that feel right to you so one of the stories i tell in the book is i'm a chaos person i love new challenges i love something different every day i haven't lived in the same house for more than you know five years in my whole life and it's um and i really resisted that chaoticness for a long time because i thought to be a good employee or to have a good career i had to do things much more orderly. I had to stay in the same job a long time. And, and because of that, I was mismatched to roles and just frankly, not very happy with my career for a long time. And when I finally figured out that I'm a chaos person and that is okay because there are chaos jobs that need my penchant for, um, you know, different things day to day, it was really quite freeing. And I've had people tell me that, you know, well, my mom wants me to be an engineer and I'm a, I'm a free spirit. And I said, you know what? Your mom will never let go of that because that's who she is and that's who she wants you to be. And so it gives you permission to say, you know what, mom, it's okay. I know you want me to be an engineer, but it's just not who I am. And so it's really quite empowering, I think, to, to read through and say, you know what, this is me and it's okay to be this. And I don't have to fight against those natural tendencies that I have. Great. I, I love that. I was just listening. You've, you've literally just described what my, I'm going personal here, my wife has been through over the last few years. Uh, and she's, I think she's probably just established based on what I understand of the, the culture. That she's probably been more of a chaos type as well. So she's gone from being an office based customer service, I guess, a complaints type management individual to 
uh, completely changing career, retraining as a massage therapist and being very practical and outwardly. And I don't think I've ever seen her happier, but it took her a long time to come around to that transition and actually what does she really want to do versus what she thinks people think she needs to be, if that makes sense. Uh, it's amazing the transition you can see in happiness in a very short space of time when you when you get comfortable with who who you are. Yeah, and that's the important thing really is our goal of this whole thing, the company, the book, the system, the culture types, is to really improve people's lives. I mean, if you have 85% of the people that go to work every day being kind of miserable or too very miserable, then they're going to have kind of miserable home lives, kind of miserable community lives. And so if you can elevate the the level of joy and engagement you have at work, then that's going to just benefit everything in your life and everyone in your life. And so it's really, I mean, to really be in the, in the States, we say motherhood and apple pie kind of thing. It's, it's about making the world a better place. And that's, and you're seeing that in that one person that's very important in your life. So imagine if we could do that for 10% of the people in London or 10% of the people in the state. It'd be a massive, massive change in in everyday life. And if you're happy at work, performance improves as well. Because if you're disengaged, you don't give right. your best well, yeah. view of yourself. So it kind of wins, you say. It's and a win-win for and, everyone. And you make more money. Yeah. 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 Companies make more money. So it's a win-win all around. We can just get, get it going. So. Fantastic. Well, I think that's a great way to finish uh, the questions for part two. We're going to open the L&D vault. Opening the L&D vault. So Rachel Meg, in hindsight, what's the one thing you now know that you wish you knew when you began your career? I don't, you know, I don't know. I don't think I wish I would have known anything. I think it's been a, I've had a great career of lessons. And if I would have known any one thing at the beginning, I would have definitely changed what I came to as a result of my career right now. So I'm going to say nothing. Final answer. She's an independent, so she loves she loves to I'm also a philosophy person. She's all also a philosopher. Yeah, I can't give sure. straight answers. That's my that's right. I'm happy with all of my lessons. Um, let's see, my career. Uh I wish I would have known I wish I would have known I was a fixer a long time ago because I think I would have leaned in and done more differently. Um, but again, I'm to, to Meg's point, man, I got to stay on top of a rocket two days before it launched in the low earth orbit. So that probably would not have happened if I had had a different path. So that's pretty epic. And that's pretty awesome. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, I know. Definitely. That's pretty much my son's total ambition. Um, So yeah, that's pretty epic. Um, What's the one common myth you often hear in the workplace in relation to leadership? And can you debunk it? Um, Well, I would say the one that we see the most often, I don't know if anybody admits to it, but the one we (laughs) see the most often is that people want more flexibility. Um, And in some ways that might be true, but what what we give up when we allow too much flexibility is our consistency um, as a business. And so business folks are not very good at seeing that. And so a lot of times a lot more flexibility leads to a lot less consistency, which leads to less accountability, which leads to employment law issues. Employment law. She's a she's a guru about that. Uh, My favorite myth is change is hard. Because change is only hard because companies make it hard. Um, change is actually really fun. And if you can think of change that you've decided on, change that um, maybe it's from primary school to university, maybe it's starting a new job that you chose, um, getting, you know, married. getting married, buying a new car, getting a pet, what a, list the things. Those are very stressful in a lot of ways. But at the end of the day, they're really fun. And at some point, you're just thrilled with the opportunity. And that is the same feeling that you could have at work if leadership managed change well. And so that's that's really the, the biggest myth that I like to kill. Fantastic. Excellent. Well, the last question in the L&D vault, I'm going to give you the first part of the answer because uh, I'm going to see what else we come with. So number one is, what's the uh, one piece of advice you would give to someone recently appointed to a leadership role who has no prior experience of leadership, assuming that they've already read your book or listened to your book, what's the one piece of advice you would give to them? Uh, I would say get to know your people. Get to know your people, write down a list of the ones you know you can trust. And and don't fool yourself about who they are, really are. <laughs> <laughs> I would say decide and design the kind of experience you want your people to have. And be very strategic about what that looks like 
and what kind of actual actionable items and uh, things that you can put into place that allows those things to happen. Fantastic. I think that's a great way to finish this uh, HRND podcast. So thank you so much for joining me for the questions. Uh, is there any way in particular, any links you'd like to highlight that our listeners can find out more about um, both of you and the uh, and the book and your and your teachings on, on internal experience in more detail? Useful links, keeping the HR L&D community connected. Well, you can find, we're pretty active on LinkedIn, although Meg is under duress. Uh, so you can find us there. We're very active. And then our website is rosegroupintl.com. Dot com, And I would just say quickly that Rose Group is after Compass Rose. And so it's uh, we're definitely all about uh, changing direction and uh, having leaders guide their people where they need to go. One last place people can learn more about what we do. If you if you for those of you who are listening, if you want to know more, uh, join us on Facebook. IX Ambassador is a, our closed Facebook group and we do a live in there every week. So and it's free. Yep. And it's free. So that's another good place. Well, I'll definitely make sure that your individual LinkedIn profiles are available in the episode notes. I'll also make sure that the closed Facebook group for IX Ambassadors is available. I'll make sure your website, rosegroupintl.com is available. Um, I've also put a couple of links in there if people want to find out more about you. You've done some brilliant talks, uh, the HR Disrupt TEDx talks. You've done, um, obviously, you've got your culture type assessment. So I'll put a link for that in there as well. There's an article which I read, Rachel, uh, in Forbes, which you, which you talk about culture types in more detail and, and makes some articles in Forbes on toxic teams. And there's loads more. So I'll try and put as many links as possible in the episode notes. Honestly, if, for my listeners not familiar with Rachel and Meg, if you haven't you know, been convinced over the course of this podcast, go and check out these links because they are absolute experts in this field. And there's so much content you guys can uh, can really absorb here. So please do take a look at the episode notes and, and, and look at some of those links and follow them. And um, hopefully you can learn an awful lot more and definitely go and find out more about the book, which I'll put a link for. It's available on Amazon. You can get it in audio. Uh, you can get it in print. Um, IX Leadership Books, I'll put a link to that as well. And of course, if you want to get your free audio book code, then please email me at nick at jjrecruitment.com with the answer to this question, which is, if Rachel and Meg were both given superpowers, what would they be? Hopefully you wrote that down earlier on in this podcast. If not, rewind and go back. That kind of leaves us me just to say, uh, if you are an HR or L&D professional listening to this podcast and you have a specific HR, HIS or L&D related vacancy that you need some, some love and support with, then please do get in touch with me. I would love to help and show you what a great HR recruitment experience can feel like. You can get me directly at nick at jjrecruitment.com or give me a call on 01727 800 377. Thanks for listening, folks. Thank you so much, Rachel. Thank you so much, Meg for joining me today it's been an absolute pleasure i've really really enjoyed it thank you thank you so much for tuning into the hr lnd podcast with your host nick day of jga hr recruitment if you need help with a current hr or lnd vacancy then please get in touch with nick and his team all contact details can be found in the episode notes in the meantime to make sure you never miss an episode please subscribe to the show through any of your favorite podcast channels till next time